brain machine interface using brain on a chip in order to understand how the brain functions. Was to put the electrode in her brain. So today I will tell you about my group's research efforts on brain machine interface using brain on a chip as a title. So my group specializes on nanoscience, nanoscience and technology. We make very, very teeny things and we make tools for studying them. Then once we actually make those tiny nanoscale structures and then actually tools for studying them, then we apply those nanoscale materials to a variety of different problems spanning, say, quantum information processing and quantum computing, sensing, as well as nanobio interfaces. And today, what I'm going to talk about is our efforts on nanobio interfaces focusing on brain machine interface. Now, at this point, you might actually ask, so what does a nanoscientist know about brain science? I can tell you authoritatively that not much. Well, I know the following. Brain is important. Without them, we do not function that well. And it is complicated. So it is composed of hundreds of billions of neurons, making hundreds of trillions of connections. And those are, without doubt, large numbers. So in fact, the brain is the most complicated organ in your body, spending, say, 30% of energy, whether you think very hard or not. So it is an important organ that is very, very complicated. And we do not know much about the brain. Microscopically, we do not know how the brain functions. So where do we start if we want to understand the governing principles about brain? Most people think that it should start with a map, map of a brain. What I mean by the map of the brain is the following. We need to know what kind of neurons there are in the brain. We need to know where they are in the brain. And we need to know what kind of connections that they are making in the brain. And that's what I mean by map. More technically, people call it connectome. Having the map of the brain is not enough. It is a starting point. Then we actually have to need to put the contents into that particular map in order to understand how the brain functions. And that's where we are trying to contribute. Now, this sounds like a daunting problem. After all, 100 billion and 100 trillion are not a small number. But if you think about it, in different ways, they are not that a daunting number. What I mean is the following. First, note that neurons, brain cells, the, you know, the cells that compose the brain, talk to each other electrochemically. They transmit electrical signal in simple terms. And if you think of it as an electrical signal transmitter, and if you look at these numbers, like 100 billion, you now realize that you actually have seen those numbers before. Where? In computer chips. When we say 100 gigabyte, Giga means billion, 100 gigabyte is 100 gig billion. So computer chips actually has hundreds of billions of components in them, and we actually carry them every day. And they work based upon electricity. Now you might say, well, oh, that's great. So we now actually have hundreds of billions of elements which work on electricity. So all we have to do is to put the brain on a chip, then we are done. We can actually use the computer chip to learn about the brain, right? Again, no. It turns out that although numbers work roughly right, this thing is very hard thing to do. The reason why is the following. Brain and computer chip are very different things. Brain is composed of living cells. As far as we know, computer chip is composed of dead things, right? They're dead. One is alive, dead. Resembles this particular situation. Let's say that you hear that Boston Red Sox, the baseball team, is doing very, very well. They are indeed red hot. They are doing very, very well. So you decide to visit Boston and then actually you know, go watch the ball game. And you find out that the ticket is completely sold out. So what you do is sit outside the ballpark, hear the crowd's roar, 
And then if you listen to them carefully, then you can actually figure out how the game is going. Obviously, home team, you know, Boston Red Sox is a home team. So if, say, they hit the home run, then crowds will make a really, really loud sound. And then if the you know, opposing team is actually take, make, you know, making a home run, then you, they will make a different sounds, right? So by sitting outside, you can kind of figure out how the ball game is going. And then so far, what computer chips have done in terms of interfacing with the brain was that, listening from outside. But of course, if you actually want to really look at the ball game, then you actually have to go inside and see the game in action. And that's what we actually have been trying to do. So what we are doing is the following. We are leveraging our nanoscience expertise to interface the brain and the computer chip in a better, high fidelity, high precision way. And then we actually have been making strides toward that direction, making a computer chip that can interface with the brain cells in a much more precise way. And this is so-called scanning electron microscope image of brain cells, those gold things, sitting on top of our computer chip. So what do we do with them? Well, one of the low hanging fruits that we are now trying to tackle together with the Broad Institute as well as Mass General Hospital is to use this particular computer chips to uh, discover some new pharmaceutical candidates and then drugs for particular patients and particular disease. So this work was inspired by one of my friends and colleague at the Brown University, John Donnelly's work, was to put the electrode in her brain and it's wired to the computer. As of now, it's not wireless, it's wired. It's really bulky. And then use that in order to read her what she's thinking so that she can move the you know, robotic arms. And in this particular movie, you will see that she's now trying to move the robotic arms and grab that bottle so that she can drink. It takes some time. This was one of the first experiments. But she could finally after some struggle, drink. And what struck me most was how happy she is. It can really make a difference. So there are lots of people who are trying to do that. But if you think about it, the fact that we are now thinking about doing it and talking about doing it and even possibly start to do it actually raises an interesting question. What do you think will happen if somebody hacks computer chips in your brain? Not only good things can happen, but bad things can also happen. And then you actually have to think about exactly what that means if you are starting to do that. And that's, you know, oftentimes what scientists think that is not in our domain, but at least I think that acknowledging it and then thinking about it certainly helps in terms of designing the chips and then doing things better. That's what I want to end this particular talk with.